This is the Boost Surf, which is the world's first electric surfboard fin. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to another video. Today we are going to be making ourselves a fin for a longboard. It's going to be glassed in and we'll be answering a few questions along the way as well. So the ingredients list, here I've cut out 15 squares of 6 ounce uh, cloth. I have cut out one square of chop strand cloth. I'm not actually sure of the weight of it. And here we have another 15 squares of four ounce cloth. And today we're going to be making a panel for this Brian Weaver fin. Brian Weaver was an old shaper from Piha in New Zealand. And the board this fin's being made for is gonna go pretty well with this, with this fin. This is not an overly complicated process, basically one square at a time, this being the first square. We're just gonna wet them out nice and flat to the glass with the squeegee. Uh, you can use a roller, we'll get into that maybe a little more down the track, but um, for now I'm just squeegeeing up the first layer and then we'll add the next. And I'm rotating these, so my first layer is a six ounce, second will be a four ounce, next will be a six ounce, and da 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 da. So I'm switching in between the four and the six. I'm gonna speed through the process a little bit, and during this video I'm gonna answer some of your questions from the last video I made, which was kind of on the subject subject of um, if you were starting or thinking of starting your own ding repair or surfboard related business what are some questions you might have so we might kick into some of them while we're laying this panel up so let's get on to the first one so the first question was from red russell and he simply said wondering how much it costs you to set all of this up so that was on the video of the tour through my workshop if you haven't seen it uh, you can go and check that out so as i said in that video I didn't go out one day, get a business loan from a bank and set the business up from scratch. The initial investment was a $700 gardening shed or garden shed that I plonked in the backyard. On top of that $700, I bought some basic tools if I didn't already have them, things like drills, orbital sanders. I went battery operated from the beginning. I think I bought the FCS router kit straight out the bat. Laminate trimmer was certainly one that you need. I was in a really good position at the start because I was still working full time as an interior plasterer, just doing ding repairs after work and on the weekends. So any money that the business made, I sank straight back in the business. So the next purchase might have been future router jigs, the next might have been an airbrush, airbrush compressor, paints. So the business slowly upgraded over time. Right now I'm probably sitting on about $5,000 worth of tools, maybe another $5,000 worth of materials, resins and cloths and carbons, all that kind of stuff. As far as storage sort of stuff goes, board racks, cupboards to keep stuff in, boards to hang tools on the walls, that kind of thing, maybe $500 to $1,000 thereabouts. I should say that those setup costs don't really include the shaping bay. I went halves on all the shaping bay costs with Justin, so the tools certainly do count, but I think the shaping bay in total cost us somewhere between two and three thousand dollars to set up. Uh, biggest cost probably would have been timber, second biggest cost would have been screws, third would have been power and the lights, fourth probably the shaping stand itself. But I wouldn't count the setup of that shed as part of the business at this stage. So that's half of our fin panel done. Now that we're in the middle, I'm going to put down my one layer of chop strand. This is really only for aesthetics. I really like the way it looks with resin tint. And so I'm putting one tinted layer down and that's on the chop strand in the center. Second question came from Storm the Ferg. And he asked, I was wondering how making videos forms a part of your business. How much time does it take and what benefit, whether it's personal or business, do you get from it? So I actually don't really have an answer to this question. I'm not sure how many of you know how YouTube or monetizing YouTube works, but currently um, I'm not monetized. So the business isn't receiving any income from these videos. That will change in the very near future and I will be able to monetize these videos. 
and that was a big part of the reason why I said when I get to a thousand subscribers I will upgrade my camera. Once the videos are monetized I feel that if I'm getting paid to do these videos that I probably owe you guys slightly better quality and maybe better imagery so we can see a little bit better at least what's going on. There was three initial thoughts that led me to create this YouTube channel. The first one was that the videos I was watching on YouTube in regards to ding repairs, a lot of them made me cringe. I felt that they were misleading or um, guiding people in the wrong direction. So that irritated me a little because I've always really liked the way YouTube is almost like plugging into the programs Neo uses in the Matrix. If you want to learn how to fly a helicopter, you just plug yourself in, download the information and you're done. And certainly that was a large part of my journey in learning how to repair boards and shape boards as well. So it frustrated me that it seemed to be really difficult to get good answers and good advice through YouTube and I don't know, if, if no one else is going to do something about it then I thought I would. The second reason, I'm on a couple of different Facebook groups which are to do with fixing and shaping surfboards and constantly on a daily basis I see the same questions and problems arising and the answers on those Facebook posts vary a lot. Some of it's really amazing advice but a lot of it is really terrible advice and if you don't really know what you're doing it's hard to weed through the terrible to get to the good so I thought if I could just make some clear and concise videos on how to solve these problems or not run into them at all that that may be beneficial to a lot of people. And the third reason was nothing short of pure greed it's all about the Benjamins my theory was if I can get a job into the workshop like this fin let's say this fin is going to cost $200 once it's done by the time I get that $200 pay my tax replace the materials my time all the rest it's not a lot of money but if I can make a video on something like making this fin then that fin will hopefully continue to give me a stream of revenue for another year or two years or however long people choose to watch my videos for. So if the jobs in my shed can continue to generate income then that's going to be a net positive for the business. As far as business goes uh, one thing I really like about YouTube is I, it seems that I'm mainly talking to international people here. It's really not in my interest to teach New Zealanders how to fix surfboards because the more people I teach how to fix surfboards, the less people are going to come and pay me to fix their surfboard. So this isn't really something I ever wanted to do on Instagram, for instance, because 90% of people on my Instagram are New Zealanders. They're either customers or other repairers. But on YouTube, I'm hopefully able to help some people out without sort of um, culling my clientele at the same time. But it's a weird position to be in. As far as how much effort or how difficult it is to um, make these videos, I don't want to sound like some spoiled influencer who's never really had a real job, but man, it's fucking hard, I tell you. It's way harder than I thought it would ever be. Not only the actually doing the editing and the filming and the angles and all that type of stuff, which clearly I'm not very good at, but um, making the time to sit down and edit a video, it, it takes hours the reason most of my videos upload at 2 o'clock in the morning New Zealand time is because that's how long it takes me after work to get one of these videos out. I can't really do it with my girlfriend in the house because it's weird enough sitting here talking to myself, let alone with someone else listening in. It makes me all self-conscious so the audio comes out really bad. Um, all little things like that, they, it's just, it's a whole new world for me. It's cool, I'm very much enjoying it, I'm very grateful for the people who are watching, so thank you guys again. But yeah, it's not as easy as I thought it would be. But hopefully in a couple of years I'll be so famous that I can start some NFT crypto project and I'll sell it to all of you, small kind tokens, and then I'll rug pull it and I'll be a millionaire. So look forward to that. So right now just sanding it all flat, getting it smooth, any little cracks and crap I don't want in the fin, I'm going to remove them and then we can trace our fin template on. So I actually templated this fin from a board that was a little bit smaller than the board that this particular fin is going to go onto. So what I'm going to do is trace the template with a Posca pen so that my lines pretty fat and wide 
and I'm going to leave the fin a little bit wider than what the template is just because I think with a bigger board it's going to be better to have just that slightly extra bit of fin. So you'll notice at the base of the fin there's that little extra bit, there's a bit of a tab there. So back in the old days what they used to do is route a hole into the board itself. It's pretty much the same as how we route a fin box into a board now. And then they'd resin the fin into the board and then they'd go about installing it from there. So the fin was actually mounted inside the board. So there's two ways that I like to, or that I choose to, remove the fin from the panel. The first one is with a jigsaw. The jigsaw is good because you get a really nice straight and square edge. You can cut out all the curves pretty close to your line, so it's good. The bad side is with 31 layers of fiberglass cloth, you're going to burn through jigsaw pieces like there's no tomorrow, so that's a little bit of a pain in the ass. The way I'm doing it here is a cutting wheel on a Dremel. It works really well. Um, you'll only use one wheel, if that. The problem with doing it with the Dremel is you can't really hold the Dremel um, square or flat, so your cuts are going to be on a slight angle, so you're going to have to run around with the sander at the end and square them all up. Once I've got all the edges nice and square, I usually trace the fin onto a blank surface like this table, and then I can have a look at the outline once it's drawn on and kind of look for any kinks or weaves that I don't like, and then I can adjust it from there. So now we're onto the foiling of the fin. I wish I could give you some kind of um, mathematical equation to let you know how to foil a fin. In all honesty, I don't shape enough fins to really be an authority on the subject. I keep a few fins handy for an occasion like this so I can feel kind of the shape I'm going for, see what they've done and then replicate it. It is important to find your center point on the fin, so running around the edge with a pencil is ideal. If you imagine that chop strand matting that I tinted is right in the center, that's where you want your pencil line. So on the back edge of the fin, you can go evenly on each side all the way to the center layer of the glass. On the front, you want to stay away from the center layer, keep a little bit of thickness in your foil, and then just round it off, kind of like the rails of a surfboard. But at all costs, you really want to avoid making the front edge of the fin sharp like a razor blade. The back edge can be sharp, the front edge needs to have a little bit of thickness and roundness to it. Here I'm cutting the base off the fin. I didn't get a straight enough edge and I think it would have sat in the board funny so I'm just, I've drawn a straight line and I'm just going to cut it off straight. We'll glass it straight onto the board when the time comes. So that's it, our fin is complete. There's a board coming into the workshop this weekend and this fin will be glassed onto that board. Maybe you know which board it is, maybe you don't. The foil is symmetrical, uh, even both sides, there's no weird twists or bows in it. It's the colour scheme that the customer requested. I did send him a photo and he was stoked on it, so he wanted this kind of like grey, see-through, not black not clear, you know, that kind of thing, whatever that is. But yeah, so the next video will be how to glass a fin onto a surfboard. Old school kind. If you've made it this far, don't turn the video off yet. I did say in the video how much effort it takes to put this kind of stuff together, all the filming, the editing, staying up late, all the rest. So if you want to subscribe, even if you don't, just hit the subscribe button. It won't hurt anybody, I promise and we'll see in the next video when we, we mount this fin to a board. Cheers for watching, guys. I really appreciate it. We'll see you in the next one.